When discussing sustainability, we like to point out that the most difficult aspects are that the topic is difficult, that there is a wealth of data, and that it can be difficult to communicate and visualize the issues, solutions, or impacts. So I'm thrilled that Valentina De Filippo will be speaking to me today. She's an awesome creative director and a designer of data visualization. It's a pleasure having her in this episode because she is an expert at connecting data visualization and human stories to create impressive visualization that helps spark conversation and help us better understand the world. I was blown away by our conversation, so hold on tight. Sustainability at Work is a podcast about sustainability in the workplace and in companies. My name is Samara been working with sustainability for almost 10 years. Good morning, good morning everybody. Thank you to, uh, thank you for being here for our sustainability at work. Thank you Valentina for being here. Thank you so much. Welcome and uh, I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, it's going to be a different episode, I guess, from others that we have done, uh, but I'm very excited because I think with your work uh, as a cre- creative director and a designer, um, especially of infographics and data visualization, you, are, you have a lot to share uh, about the biggest problem in sustainability, which I think are measuring visualizing uh, all the things that we are measuring and the data, trying to communicate them and push people to action, maybe. Um, So let's start. Um, As I say, uh, sustainability is a a lot about measuring and data. And you have worked uh, on some projects which were very much related to sustainability. Um, Do you think we are measuring the right data, the right thing, or we're missing something? I think that's the main question to start with. Possibly the biggest question that we could possibly start with. Well, I must say, I'm not an expert in sustainability, but it's definitely like the the millennium challenge, isn't it? The century, the millennium challenge is our age challenge. How do we communicate these big crises that we're all part of climate change? Science is not new. The data has been there for decades. Um, It's just really hard to change things. And of course, change happens when you understand it, when you're communicating correctly, in effective way, in compelling way, in personable ways, so that people actually act. And it's about people, individual action, but it's also about corporations, right? And I think you are really touching on a very important question. So like, what is the data that we are communicating? And I feel like it's been very um, politicized in a way, right? All these like net zero, the carbon footprint. Carbon, carbon. Are we measuring? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is very, very abstract as a concept, right? Carbon is really hard to uh, get your head around. It's hard to manifest. It's hard to make sense of and I don't really think actually we're communicating the right thing and I think it's because the root of it of this communication is uh is the fact that this concept are very much rooted in uh, politics isn't it like I'm not an expert again but I mean if you're thinking about the carbon footprint as a concept was kind of born um, at the turn of the millennium by BP or another big giant, right? <laughs> that was basically shifting the, re- the responsibility back to the consumers to say, hey, you can actually do good by measuring your carbon footprint. But actually, we should shift the narrative back to who has the power to make change rather than putting so much responsibility to the individual. And this net zero is also like very much almost like a fallback I believe of like um, almost like neutralizing your impact or your bad doing <laughs> when actually it's not solving any problem. Mm-hmm. And I think all of these concepts are very much rooted in this um, in this kind of traditional way of thinking, communicating, but also designing of uh, human center. We are at the center of the universe, and we can control it all. We're mm-hmm. actually climate change should really 
pose a question and shift the narrative, right? Because as we know, even through COVID, just recently to the pandemic, we can't control it all. And we're definitely not at the center of the universe. Um, we're part of an ecosystem. And when this system is, in ban- is out of balance, uh, we're going to all suffer from it. We're all going to be affected from it. So yeah, I think I've, absolutely you're starting the conversation from a very important question. So what is the data that we're communicating? What is the narrative? What is the story, the responsibility? How much has been politicized? And I think all of that is really the root of the problem of like why we have not created the change that we that we should have seen really, because the science has been pointing out, right, the data and what's happening for a very long time. But this change is not quite there. Hmm. And, and this reminds me a little bit of your TEDx. Uh, in your TEDx, you talk about how, well, uh, about your passion for, um, for maps and, and you talk about um, this problem that we all have that we, tell our narrative from our point of view, from where we are. So just what you say now, maybe the problem of climate change is that we are always in the middle and everything is around us and we should shift yeah. that focus. So maybe that, that those things are connected. How do you do that? How do you shift your, your point of view uh, and, and try to see the story from another side? How do you do it in your personal life and how do you push others to work with yeah, your work? I don't think I don't think I've got uh, the solution for that but I suppose it's probably like my work mission of how can we use the instrument of design to widen our own perspectives that's what I'm really trying to do with my work not sure I ever managed to do that but I guess like what I'm trying to do is uh, rather than just creating a render of the data, rather than just creating an image of the data, I'm trying to put perspective, to create feeling, to make people sense and feel this implication of the data so that they can truly expand their view. Often I think the problem with, um, with any sort of communication is that unless we have experienced it, it's really hard to get our head around it, right? Because we are navigating the world through our own experience. Um, And there is a lot of emphasis on empathy and empathy can only truly be felt when you've been there, when you can be in somebody else's shoes, right? That's really the concept of empathy. I can only feel what you feel if I can truly experience what, you, what you're going through. And I think perhaps a better term to describe this connection is not empathy, but it's compassion. Even if I can't truly understand what you're going through, for me, expanding my point of view is like, make me feel or understand as close as possible your experience. And therefore I think science and the data that we're communicating truly needs um, the values of arts, right? The emotions, the humanity, um, the design can bring um, to really make people feel the implications, sense it, and go over or beyond um, just the numbers, but really see what they mean. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. But maybe I was thinking if you can do, a co- if you can share a couple of examples with your work of how you try to do that and how people reacted? Yeah, so for instance, like just recently I was collaborating with the Museum of London and the question that kind of like started the collaboration was really big, um, was how has uh, COVID transformed our cities, our world, and specifically focusing on London because it's the Museum of London was the commissioner. And I thought, how can we actually describe that through data? We've got plenty of data, right? Data points, it describes the number of cases, the number of hospitalization, number of deaths. Is that enough to truly describe how the pandemic has transformed our lives? Probably not, because everybody, again, is a unique experience of what the pandemic has been, how your life has been affected, um, how perhaps you've been fortunate or you know, the loss that you've experienced, whatever they might have been, right? So I guess to describe this different perspective, I wanted to create a space. So rather than telling an answer with data or trying to provide an answer with the data, which is actually impossible to describe how 
our world has changed. I wanted to create space to archive what has happened and to really uh, allow people to remember their own experience of the first year of the pandemic and also to expand this perspective, this personal experience, to be reminded that beyond our own experience, there were so many different um, stories. So what I created is, uh, um, uh, is an animated film uh, called London Under the Microscope. Every second of the movie is one day of the first year of the pandemic. And London has been transformed through uh, visual storytelling with the metaphor of the virus. So you actually see the geography of London, the cartogram being represented on and mapped on top of the three-dimensional virus. You see all the um, uh, local authorities, the boroughs of London, you see the spikes that create the coronavirus structure and those spikes are representing the cases per day. And then from the cases from the spikes, you see the particles that are appearing, kind of the proteins. And those are the deaths that are happening every day. And then they disappear, they accumulate in the background to create almost like a, uh, an X-ray effect. It is changing the scene to transform it into black and white, into an invert world. You also see um, the vaccines coming into play in December um, 2020 uh, with the filaments, almost like a positive halo to, to this ecosystem. And all the data is not only visualized, but it's also sonified. So there is a very much of like a sensorial and visceral experience that, 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 that is conveyed through the sound. Um, and I guess like what I really wanted to do is was rather than creating a, something that was a full stop of like, this is what has happened. It was almost like a starting point for a conversation. This was all the data, but what was your experiences of you were? How are you feeling? Are you sad? Are you reminded of a loss? Are you, are you actually glad that this year is over? Um, you know, what has happened in your story? That was my point of view. And data for me often should be used as, um, as a communication starter, right? As a, as a dialogue, as a starting point rather than the end point. So I, I think this idea of creating a space is, is, is very powerful and I can see you can see it in your, uh, your project really. Um, uh, I was wondering, uh, there is a lot of use of sound um, I've seen also the, the Sentinel um, show, and, but also the other one that you did about the music. So how, do you, how does um, sound music and other, um, em, let's say emotion or other experience play in, uh, in the visualization? So yeah, I really like, like to experiment with what we can do when we're communicating data, because often whenever you're thinking about data visualization, as words say, it's confined to the, to the world of the site, right? The visual, we're visualizing data. But I think ultimately our goal as information designers, as a data storytellers, is to communicate stories, is to convey the insights behind the numbers. And I think like confining all our output and execution into just this visual world is, um, is limiting. Where actually there are so many possibilities to make people feel, react, engage make them stop and pause you know there is uh, so much information overload that we have nowadays and i think it's just another strategy to get people to pay attention mm -hmm. to stop to pause and to engage right mm -hmm. um and i think i think sound is a powerful tool that we can have that we can add to the visual but there are so many other senses that i think are kind of unexplored and i think it's kind of exciting to to explore and to try and to see how people react to mm -hmm. more visual experiences. So this connects very well with uh, another question I wanted to ask you. What do you think is the, the biggest enemy of social uh, change and, and what are our uh, most useful tools? Because as you say, there is a lot of anesthesia, uh, too many data. Um, so even when we have maybe good data, how, how we communicate is really important. And, and, and even if we get to people, then what about 
action. So it, it's quite difficult. I don't know if you have not a solution, of course, but uh, some yeah, from I wish some I had. <laughs> I wish I had. Um, I guess I've got some thoughts um, that I can share. So I guess like, uh, I think the main enemy, again, is uh, this uh, anesthesia, right? This apathy. It's not even the information overload. It's more that whenever we're receiving this information, whenever we are at this end, it's like, yeah, but what can I do, right? It's, it's another data point. It's not a negative thing. It's not a fact. And there is so much responsibility being put on me and I'm so small, you know, like how can I possibly do anything when the world out there is so evil and, you know, nobody seems to care. So I think he's perhaps shifting the narrative into a more of like uh, connectivity and positivity making us feel part of a community of a bigger movement making us feel like we're not just an individual trying to make a change, but we are part of a movement that is happening. And so I think like a positive, uh, um, a positive narrative, which is happening. I can see it happening, but perhaps um, not the rate that we're expecting. And again, I think part of the problem goes back to the roots of it, uh, of this communication is being massively politicized. Um, but yeah, I think like humanize the data, make people feel, um, make people feel connected, giving voice, right, to these data points. Um, unfortunately, especially in, this, in the context of climate change, the people that are directly uh, suffering right now are the marginalized communities. It's not actually the Western world, right? It's going to come. <laughs> we're all going to be part of it in this crisis and we're going to be feeling it. But right now, actually, the people that are suffering the most are the least responsible. So using data to give voice to these people, I think, is the best thing that we can possibly do. And then making people feel connected and uh, feel compassionate that we are all part of the same planet and we can help and we can change. And yeah, uh, the fact that this, um, this crisis, we can't feel it and it's not in front of our eyes every day doesn't mean that it's not happening. It will happen to the next generation, to our children. Um, and it's happening already to our neighbors, you know? Um, so, yeah. And I think um, you visualize it very well with the with the those last moments of your TEDx, when you did the, the visual uh, human infographics <laughs> where all the public was connected with the yarn, with the red yarn, and you could see from above the connection and it was a really a, a strong human interaction uh, visually really so i, yeah. I, I, really I just really like wish that. people could see how we're all connected it's that's i guess is like my maybe lifetime goal to really give uh, data and data visualization the ability and the power to to show those human stories and to make us feel connected um, in a way you study the brain um, there are some people, you, you did the um, brain user guide. So maybe mm -hmm. you have some uh, findings on this. Uh, there are some people who say that our brains are not able to perceive such connections, a huge connection that we have today, because in the past we couldn't really see them. We, we were focused on our own reality and that was all. Now all this connection is too much for our brain. Could that be one reason? Yeah, it's possible. And again, it comes down to um, this personal perspective, right? And personal perspective is usually built on experience of like, unless you really try, unless you really fault it, it's really hard to, to feel it. Um, so yeah, possibly. <laughs> So uh, I, I just wanted to um, ask you another uh, question, which is very typical in sustainability, and it's about oversimplification. So sustainability mm. is often about uh, problems which are systemic. They are connected, once again. And if you try to, con to talk about a problem in sustainability, often you have to simplify it, because otherwise it's too much data, too much connection, too much thing related. How do you do? How do you go in through this 
process of simplify without oversimplify and still tell the people about those connections which are important yeah. because it's a system. It's actually um, a really interesting question what you're posing there because it's not just in climate change we're trying to simplify. I feel actually most often the definition of data visualization or infographic story, storytelling is the simplification of data. And I truly hate the term. I actually really would like to go back to the dictionary and erase it. Because I think um, what we're really tr trying to do is uh, clarification rather than simplification. And often reducing things to just one data point or um, extrapolating it from the bigger picture can be really harmful, right? Because you just simplify the complexity of the world to one data point. It doesn't quite make sense. Um, so I think really what we're trying to do is clarifying this complexity to create bridges, to clarify through hierarchy, right? This depth and the interconnection and the, um, the system, the, the race behind one data point, one statistic. And I also think like, um, from a communicator point of view is um, there is kind of like an ethical question there, right? Like, is it right to simplify the picture when you know the full picture? Like your audience deserve to know the full picture, you know, it's kind of like, um, and I guess it comes with any arts, with any form of communication. How do you frame the picture, right? If you are the photographer and you're able to see the entire landscape, what snapshot do you give? Do you give a panoramic view or do you just give like the, the point? I suppose like the level of simplification helps sometimes to just engage people at the first level, at the first glance, but then you need to allow to explore the full landscape if you have seen it and if you know it, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so people can interpret it and can kind of like question it and uh, can question also your way of seeing, right? Because the frame that you perhaps proposed at the beginning is not the, the only story. It's not the only answer. Um, there can be things that you've missed mm -hmm. that, the other, that other people can discover and can see. So I think really um, allowing people to access the complexity is almost our responsibility as communicators, rather than simplifying it. So clarification, I suppose, is, uh, is the goal. And then simplification has the reason because there is just so much that you can take in. And it's almost like a shortcut into this story, but allowing people to take in all the complexity is definitely like um, a goal per se. So in a way, I think once again, the metaphor of bringing people to a place it's, it's, it's the key one, uh, I think. So bring some data in, explain, and but then let them move around those and find their own narrative. Um, so uh, this is an, uh, a big question that I wanted to ask you. Do you think that data has failed us in the last year because we had inequalities, a huge uh, pandemic of inequalities and racism that we found out. <laughs> uh, we had COVID, uh, we had climate change, and for all these things, we had the data right in front of you, uh, of us, as you said at the beginning, actually. Did the data fail us? The communication failed us? Uh, are we learning something uh, for <laughs> the future? I'm an optimism, okay, I'm an optimist. So um, let's frame the end of this interview in an optimistic way. I think data has not failed us. It's possibly the way that we're looking at it. Um, we should humanize more the data. Mm -hmm. We should um, politicize it less. Um, and we should put the responsibility where the power is. <laughs> and I think that's, that's key really. Um, mm -hmm. Data and power, they really go hand in hand. But I would say like with just these last two years, data has shown us that it's an amazing tool and so is technology and so is connectivity. Um, so I'm optimistic and kind of thinking things are changing. Perhaps the speed of change is not quite there and we really need to see more of like um, a movement really happening. 
But I, I do believe that data is an amazing tool that we have. And so it's designed to really um, unleash the power of the data, right? To connect people um, and to make data um, kind of like uh, an empower tool or a tool to empower people to navigate the world, the complexity, and to inform better decision-making. Um, so, yeah, I would say, no, data has not failed us. Uh, we've just not put the communication of the data in the right way, I suppose. Do you think it's but, yeah. a problem of education also, of the future generation of designers? I don't know. I have no idea how if the education on that side has changed? I think it's changed, definitely. Like, uh, I see it evolving. I mean, since I started in, um, in data visualization, there wasn't much um, talk happening about um, the fallibility of data, right? Of like, the fact that data is just a footprint of the world, that is not the full picture. Um, even with COVID, right? We had this very sophisticated and almost like daily count, but still was not the full picture, right? How many cases were not reported, deaths were not reported and so forth. So it was still kind of like a blurred picture of what was happening, but still incredibly helpful to navigate the chaos of the pandemic. So I think like the conversation is definitely expanding into the fallibility of data, into um, uh, the humanization of data, uh, the fact that it is our responsibility to really think about what are we counting, how are we counting it, what is the methodology, um, and what stories are we framing. Um, and I think like just when I started 15 years ago, data had much more of like an arrogant tone, like it is evidence and that's it, when actually... Um, is an, is an incredible tool that we have, but just one of the many tools that we have. I see some parallels with, with economics. Economics also has changed quite in the same way. I was very arrogant. I, I don't know if you maybe read the, the books of Donut Economy. Uh, mm -hmm. In the Donuts Economy, um, uh, Kate uh, Ransworth talks about uh, how economics, uh, the, the faculties of economics were so so convinced about uh, their work and so convinced about their power and everything and how that thing changed so much. So I guess it, it's quite uh, similar. Um, I have a last question for you because time is, uh, is finishing. Um, what is your next challenge? Uh, so I, I've heard you talking a lot about the human side of data. Are you exploring that side or? So I'm actually uh, right now um, collaborating with environmental agency here in the UK, um, doing some sustainability project uh, related to climate change, which are really exciting. I'm also collaborating on a new editorial project, bringing an encyclopedia uh, narrating the world and the many different challenges, but also the many different uh, um, you know, amazing things that happened in history, in science, in human evolution to kids. So that's really exciting to bring um, data storytelling to a younger audience. And that's perhaps also part of like what we can do um, as part of our generation to create a movement is just to raise the bar of data literacy, maybe from a younger age, to teach um, kids to read data visualization from a younger age. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Valentina. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And I hope to hear soon, another, uh, to see soon another project of yours. Thank you so much. Bye, Valentina. Thanks for having me.